Your three sons, the children of an African-American mother and a Caucasian Jewish father, are at the intersection of two terrible things in our culture, racism and anti-Semitism. During their upbringing, I wonder how you dealt with that and prepared them for this world. The bottom line message was, you know, you're God's child. Nobody can impinge on that. Second, I don't care what the outside world says, you know, you know, you are as good as any child. And third, you can change things. I was a rebel from the time I was four or five. I went with my Sunday school teacher up to the belt department store. And I didn't know the difference if I was four or five, I don't know. I, I didn't know the difference between white and black water. I didn't pay attention to the signs and I ended up drinking out of the white water fountain. And my Sunday school teacher, who was also a public school teacher, she just, she, she panicked, okay? And she jerked me off the fountain and said, you can't eat that, I said, why? And she just tried to point to the two signs. Well, that was fine. I went home with my little psyche and told my parents what had happened, but they reaffirmed, you know, whatever. But I would go switch the, the white and black water fountain fountains all over town, wherever I could see it. <laughs> I would just do that. The white public library was not closed, it was closed to us. But my father and mother always had books in our home. That would come before a second pair of shoes. The cocoon of the black community, of my family, of my church, and of my public school teachers, with the hand-me-down things from the white school, or we sang Lift Every Voice and Sing Every Morning, which is the Negro National Anthem. And, you know, it, it was this, and, and, and a part of what we're doing with Freedom Schools now is to make sure that children know their heritage and know that whatever the external world says, that there's a proud history here. And so, but I just had the greatest community co-parents and the greatest parents, and so what was there to be um, concerned about? I don't always knew I'd try to make a difference because I had parents who made a difference. How do you change someone's inner morality, their values. In Washington now, with a president who is allergic to fact and uh, as amoral as you could be. He's immoral, he's evil. This is biblical evil that we see now going on. Let's just call it what it is. It's beyond obscene. This, I mean, it really is a time of biblical evil, but we are not gonna go backwards. I'm determined I'm not gonna have my grandchildren, my granddaughters, or my grandsons fight these same battles all over again, and Mr. Trump is not gonna win. He's everything you want your children not to grow up, but he's a reflection of the system that has locked in, you know, the greed of the few at the expense of the many, and that's why we are in here trying to say, listen, um, our children are our Achilles heel. And you may not like these poor black kids, okay? Um, or these are, but they're gonna determine how well we compete in the world. Leave no child behind and give every child a healthy, fair, head, safe, and moral start in life, okay? And I, it's, 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 you want for other people's children what you want for your own. It's gonna be our Achilles heel if we don't invest in this next generation. How many are you gonna imprison? And so we try to do the cost effectiveness argument, but we also say it's basically right, okay? And how can we be of anybody who aspires to democratic values or just the spiritual values. Um, and all you hypocritical Christians, okay, come on, Jew, whoever we're people of faith, how can you do this? But I always appeal to the self-interest after I make my little moral or spiritual arguments. And we made an enormous amount of progress that we would not have made had we just been doing the traditional civil rights work. We're still separate but unequal in every way, okay? And we focus on the budget process. I'm just in the process of preparing the next three reports, which we do every year, a portrait of inequality in child poverty. We had Nobel laureate um, Bob Solo 15 years ago tell us how much it costs to keep children to 500, yeah, 500 billion dollars a year. Uh, we're not educating poor, and the, the cost of child poverty. We can't afford to keep children poor. Okay, we just can't. Every child in America should have the kind of prenatal care. 
Every child should be immunized. We're trying to keep children out of hospitals. We're trying to see that they're all immunized. And we try to say, you can't afford not to do it. Here's what it costs you. Immunize a child, here's what it costs to keep them in the hospital if they get this kind of disease or that kind of disease. And then we say that the money is there and we look at the immunization rates for the Defense Department personnel, pet, pets. And so we are able to get it back. I mean, it, there are no silver bullets, but we have really focused in on drafting the policies, saying how we would pay from, for them, okay, and how much it would save us and how many children we would save us. And so there are 35 laws in the books now, but they don't come in one swell swoop. You go age by age and you say it costs more to do this than we still spend money against our self-interest, okay? Mm -hmm. It costs three times more to keep these children. I mean, states are spending on, on, on average three times more per prison than for public school pupil. That's about the dumbest thing. And the main thing you do is preventive investment in every child, okay? And you say how much that costs. But God did not make two classes of children. And if you've had somebody enslaved in separate and unequal schools for, for decades, for, for centuries, okay? Mm -hmm. You, know, you, you can't compete, you said you gotta level the playing field. And so um, I, um, um, I, I don't talk about affirmative action, I just say invest in this child because it's gonna save you this amount of money. How do you create hope? How do you create it? You have children who get early childhood from the beginning. It's about a sense that you can, you can, you can um, have a better life, I will never forget two experiences I had with children, one after the riots in Harlem, and, I, and, and after, after, Robert, after Dr. King's assassination, I went out in the public schools, and I told these children in the city of Washington not to riot and not to ruin their future, and a little boy about 10 looked me in the eye and said, lady, what future? I ain't got no future, I ain't got nothing to lose. I'm trying to get everybody to go into teaching so that the schools are exciting. The one thing that Freedom Schools is doing, we are producing a young a cohort of young black men who are changing their majors and going into schools. It's hard to be, but you can't see. <laughs>